Hello, everyone. I'm Terry Stoops, the Vice President for Research and the Director of Education Studies at the John Locke Foundation. I'm also co-founder of Carolina Charter Academy in Andrew, North Carolina. If you want to know more about our school, check out uh, Carolina Journal's Daily Journal today, where I write a little bit about my experiences interacting with parents who are asking us deep, dark questions about our school, like, can I sign my baby up? That was an actual question we received. And I told the uh, person who asked that question, I, I appreciate your enthusiasm. And if it was possible to sign your baby up for our school, we would. But unfortunately, you have to wait until your baby comes of age. Um, it is fitting that the first day of National School Choice Week falls on Martin Luther King Day. Um, Alveda King, Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s niece, uh, in response to uh, School Choice Week last year, wrote, is it moral to tax families, compel their children's attendance at schools, and then give them no choice between teaching methods, religious or secular education, and other matters? Is it consistent to proclaim, meanwhile, that America is a nation that prides itself on competition, consumer choice, freedom of religion, and parental responsibility? I can't presume to know exactly what my uncle would say about the current debate over school vouchers and choice, but I know what principles he taught, and I know that he not only preached, but also practiced them. Martin Luther King Jr. and his siblings were products of private and public education. In turn, they educated their children in both public and private schools, and impressed upon my generation the importance of faith and family in effective schooling. The issue is not what families choose, but rather that they be allowed and empowered to do so. So it's in that spirit I introduce our speaker for today, Mike Long, President of Parents for Educational Freedom in North Carolina. For over 35 years, Mike has taught and trained in public school systems, private and parochial schools, churches, and youth organizations across America. Mike comes to PFNC after leading Carmel Christian School as its head of school in Charlotte. He has more than 35 years of experience as a middle school teacher, an AP U.S. history teacher, a high school principal, and a head of school. Mike is also one of the pioneers of abstinence education in America, having trained over 60,000 educators in directive teaching and spoken to over one million teens on the virtues of respect, responsibility, maturity, discipline, and character. Producer of the nationally acclaimed Everyone Is Not Doing It video series and author of two books, Mike has a long track record of professional communications and branding experience. He's also worked to successfully lobby the North Carolina General Assembly and U.S. Congress for his advocacy and education issues. Mike was born and raised in Durham, educated in the Durham public school system, and graduated from UNC Chapel Hill. So please welcome our speaker for today, Mike Long. Thank you, everyone. Where's all the cheering for UNC Chapel Hill? Come on. Uh, I will tell you this. Uh, when I went to Carolina, I lived in the same dorm with a guy who could play a little bit of basketball. His name was Michael Jordan. I don't know if you ever heard of him or not. Uh, this was uh, 1982, my uh, uh, junior year, his freshman year, uh, Granville Towers. We used to uh, uh, play pickup hoops with the uh, basketball team because they lived in Granville Towers at that time. So Michael Jordan, James Worthy, Sam Perkins, Matt Darty, the 1982 championship team, we'd get out there in the black top. Now, I never guarded Michael Jordan personally. Uh, I just kind of ran with someone else, but we ran and played hoops with these guys back then. We knew he was going to be great. We just didn't know he was going to be the all-time greatest. But I'll tell you my claim to fame, I have beaten Michael Jordan in a game of horse before, so thank you very much. Um, I, can't, uh, I can't prove it. He would never admit it, and it doesn't matter anyway. Uh, but it's, it's, it's great to be with you today uh, on a holiday, a cold day. My goodness, thank you for coming, and I appreciate you uh, uh, being here. I, I want to be able to... 
uh, spend as much time with you as possible on an issue that is very dear to my heart. And I think the best way for me to do that is to share with you how in the world I got involved in this, since I am uh, uh, the new president now six months into the job. Uh, uh, our vice president of PEFNC is also with us today. Many of you know Brian Jodis, who is right up here in the front. Uh, Brian wanted this to be as professional as possible, so he helped put together this slideshow for me. And so we start with who this guy is. I thought, man, you did. You put a good-looking fella up there uh, to get this thing started, but I'm not going to stay on that one too long. I am born and raised in Durham, and I am a product of the Durham public school system. I went to Northern Durham High School, graduated 1979, big football uh, school there, and then, of course, went to Chapel Hill. And uh, when I graduated from Carolina, I went into teaching. I was a 7th and 8th grade social studies teacher in the Durham public school system. Being kind of big and loud and relatively intimidating in appearance to a 7th and 8th grader, the principal at my school thought we're going to put all the troublemakers in Mr. Long's class. He's big, he's loud, he'll be able to keep them straight long enough to teach them something. So I took on this challenge. What struck me about this special group of kids was they had been labeled by the administration as the lost cause. And they were labeled lost cause based on their background, their circumstances, their family life, the neighborhood they lived in. Some were labeled simply because of the color of their skin. Now, this was completely unacceptable to me. You know, I'm fresh out of college. I'm ready to go into the classroom and change the world. So I felt the best thing I could do with these kids, instead of developing the teacher-student relationship with them, I need to develop more of a friend-to-a-friend -friend type relationship with them. I, I like to use the word mentor. Because what these kids were searching for was real direction in life because most of them were not getting it from home. And so I let them know, if anything's ever bothering you, come and talk to Mr. Long about it. I was emphatic. If, you, if you're upset about something, rather than taking it out on someone out in the hallway, come, come and talk to me. Even if you don't go to math or English, you come and talk to Mr. Long. And maybe that's why they always came and talked to Mr. Long. But at the end of every conversation, these kids would look at me and go, thank you so much, Mr. Long, for helping me. And I thought to myself, but I didn't tell you anything. And what I learned from that was all these kids were looking for was someone who would just simply take the time to sit down and listen to them. Just listen to them. And so I did a lot of listening. And in doing a lot of listening, I began to hear their questions and their concerns about peer pressure, about alcohol, about drugs, and definitely about sex. This is the early 80s, and AIDS has come on the scene. There's a big fear out there. And so there, there's many questions being asked. The North Carolina General Assembly wanted to address it and uh, uh, passed some very responsible legislation in the mid-80s on adolescent pregnancy prevention programs. And I had developed a strategy of teaching with these kids. Uh, you heard Terry mention it, uh, directive teaching. It's, it's teachers learning how to get on a teenager's level, meeting them where they are in their culture and directing them how to make smart, healthy decisions while building respect responsibility, maturity, discipline, character, you know, the very core values that all of us want for our kids. So this style of teaching and teaching character like that, this wasn't liberal conservative, this wasn't Republican Democrat. This is something that all people wanted because we're talking about their children and what's best for kids, what's best for families. So the General Assembly appropriated these funds and I decided to apply for one of these adolescent pregnancy prevention programs. Phil Kirk was head of HHS at the time. He told me, Mike, uh, there were about 150 applications, and you want to know why yours was funded? I said, yes, sir. He said, because out of all of those applications, yours was the only one that said, teach sexual abstinence until marriage as a standard in order to avoid teen pregnancy, the spread of AIDS and other STDs, the emotional heartache. It's 100% effective, and if it's taught correctly, it works very, very well. Kids will embrace it. Families will embrace it. So the General Assembly embraced it, and the General Assembly appro uh, uh, appropriated for it. Next thing I know, I'm all over the country training teachers how to teach it. This is in the public schools. And, and so all the, the, the doors are wide open because you also probably remember back in the 80s a movement called Just Say No to Drugs, Just Say No, Just Say No. And as well-intentioned as that was, you know, my thoughts are, uh, it's okay to, you know, but, but kids need to understand why you should just say no. And so this put a kind of a negative connotation on me. Abstinence is a negative word. Uh, it, it's the positive that teaches. And so I took the directive approach on this and we began to have great success. They, they accepted me because I was one of them. I was a teacher that just wants the best for kids. And so now we're seeing a great movement occur, not only in North Carolina, but throughout the entire country. 
So the legislature takes notice again. My great, great lifelong friend, I've known him all my life, Robin Hayes, was in the legislature in the mid-90s. Uh, Robin and I worked together with this great gentleman right over here, as I'm so, so glad to see Russell Capps. Uh, a great leader in all of this as we uh, got a state law passed that in any public school health class, sexual abstinence until marriage will be the standard taught above anything else. It was passed in a bipartisan support because we were able to reach across the aisle on what's best for kids, what's best for families, not what's best for a system, not what's best for a bureaucracy, and that's what worked. Then we go to Washington. Many of you remember our one-term senator back in the uh, uh, mid-90s, Locke Faircloth. And as part of the 1996 Welfare Reform Act, we introduced amendment there for, um, um, to appropriate $50 million in block grants to the states for the sole purpose of teaching these programs in a directive style. Uh, not only was this passed in a Democrat uh, uh, Congress, it was signed by Bill Clinton. So in other words, once again, reaching across the aisle, what's best for kids, what's best for families, what works? And so I'm involved in all that. So of course, a little piece of that as well, uh, you know, then you're on Fox News and you're debating and you're on CNN and you're debating and uh, uh, you're, you're getting a little experience here and there and then working politically and, uh, and then back in uh, nine, uh, just eight years ago, I'm turning 50 years old and there's a new president in the White House who by the stroke of a pen eliminates all of it and it's suddenly gone and I'm going 80 percent of my work is now down the drain what am I going to do uh, I don't I mind sharing I get with my pastor at Providence Baptist Church what am I going to do well where do you live Mike out in Wakefield Plantation North Raleigh why don't you there's a there's a place up there called Southeastern Seminary uh, why don't you go get your master's degree in Christian school administration and take that 25 years and wring all of that experience out in something called a Christian school I did that, just like my friend back there, Sam Curran, also did something like that not long ago. And so I got this, and so I became a head of school in Roswell, Georgia. Uh, went down to Fellowship Christian School, led that for five years, and then Carmel Christian in Charlotte called me, and Libby and I came back home to North Carolina that we love so much, and led that school for two years. This brings me to March, and I'm going to move on. Uh, I get a call from one, another lifelong best friend who happens to be the chairman of our board of Parents for Educational Freedom, uh, Rick Adams in Durham. Mike, our president of 12 years, has uh, resigned to go take a position in the national organization of this movement. I think this is something that could be right up your alley with your background, your educational experience, and all of those things. So I considered it, looked into it, and uh, fell in love with it. And I could just see all of the parallels. The thing that impressed me the most about it was how it reaches out to both sides of the aisle. When we talk about Martin Luther King Day, to me, school choice and educational reform is the civil rights movement of our time because of what it does for families, what it does for the economy, what it does for the environment. These are the things I'd like to touch on briefly and then just be glad to take some of your questions. So I couldn't be happier to be in the position. Uh, it's, a, it's been a long journey, but uh, one that I'm extremely excited about. What do we do at PEFNC? Well, PF&C, uh, Parents for Educational Freedom, it's a nonprofit organization that advocates for quality education options through parent, parental school choice. May I emphasize at this point, this includes the traditional public schools. One of the biggest misnomers out there is that our organization is not for the public schools. We are for the public schools in the sense that we want to make them better. Where they're failing, we want to make them better. And, but we also realize that each one of these uh, zip codes does not work accordingly to what that parent or that family may need. So there should be choice involved as well. North Carolina Source for Parental School Choice, we believe in allowing parents to send their children to the school of their choice. Again, let me emphasize, either a traditional public school or a non-traditional school. And PFNC recognizes that education is not a one-size-fits-all, that children have unique needs, families should have the freedom to choose the best education to help meet those needs. So our mission in that is three major pillars. One is to engage, educate, and empower the community throughout the state of North Carolina. On the engagement side, on the grassroots level, we have an outstanding parent liaison team. These are mostly moms, who uh, have children that are in the schools, and we have 12 now 
in regions across the state. What they do is they go out and they seek families that, are, that could benefit from an opportunity scholarship, which is designed for low-income families to be able to get, a, 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 right now at the current level, a $4,200 scholarship to be able to go to the school of their choice. And so they're reaching out, building relationships on the grassroots level with thousands and thousands of parents throughout the state. They're not even aware of these programs that the legislature has put out there without these parent liaison, uh, uh, these parents out there uh, informing them about it. And then with PF and C and the marketing that we do throughout the state. So that's how they hear about it. Then they need to know how to apply, how to go through it. The parent liaisons, in, uh, liaisons engage on the grassroots level. Then we educate them for the options that are available. Not only the three types of scholarships through the Opportunity Scholarship or the uh, uh, Children with Learning Disability Scholarships or now the uh, Education Savings Accounts which, uh, which complement those uh, children with disabilities. Uh, we are educating these folks to, to know exactly what's available and then what school could help best meet the needs of that child. Uh, so on our website, we have uh, we put different uh, 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 tools on there that helps parents find the school uh, that best meets their needs. And then finally, to me, this is one of the major ones, uh, is empowering parents uh, to, to have a voice in their child's education. Uh, if we're depending on parents to raise their children, which is our sole responsibility, then why would we not want them to also choose the school that works best for that child. We make choices all the time. I just made a choice to eat at Wendy's when I came here. <laughs> I, I could have gone to, uh, gone to McDonald's, I could have gone to Burger King, I could, but I was able to make a choice on what was best for me because I gotta tell you, I hadn't had a burger in a while and I feel great up here right now because of Wendy's. Uh, but I was able to make that choice. Uh, let me just give you a few numbers to look at, and uh, this is a compilation between 2017-2018. North Carolina, uh, approximately 1.4 million of our children attend the traditional public schools. Absolutely significant, very relevant to the discussion. But then let's look a little bit further. We have just over 100,000 that uh, participate in public charter schools, and I want to emphasize the word public. Uh, that's it's another misnomer out there that charter schools are private schools. They are not. They are public schools. They're operated differently. But again, you see the phrases and the words that uh, uh, some want to uh, put out there to discourage those to participate. Public charter schools. Private schools, just over 100,000 as well. And then in the home schools, 135,000. So when you look at this over the last three years, the traditional public schools, we're seeing a decrease in attendance year after year. Now, you may think that that minus 22,000 is not significant. It's a 1.8% decrease, but it is significant because it's the only part of the schools that are available that is actually losing attendees. Now, there's a, we, we have to ask, why is this happening? Charter schools, that's an increase of 30%, 30%. Private schools, an increase of 4%. And in home schools, an increase of 15%. So there's something going on here. There's a, there is a definite trend taking place. So then I think it's only prudent that we ask the question, why? I want to share with you a video that helps explain the reason why. Hi, my name is Mike Long, and I'm the new president of Parents for Educational Freedom in North Carolina. We're here at a school in Durham talking about a family that has really benefited from what this school has been able to provide, the Bradford family. It's a story that really caught my heart, and one of the main reasons why I wanted so much to be a part of this organization and have the opportunity to lead it. I hope this will touch your heart as much as it's touched mine. We're in an environment now where these children are not seen as children. They're not treated like children. And there truly is no word to describe that. To, to, there's no, no, nothing to sum that up. We enrolled her full-time at Immaculata Catholic School in downtown Durham. The grant paid full tuition and was able to cover a little bit of her speech therapy. She had 
at her best year yet. Where she is, that she's happy, that my kid loves school. How many people have kids that love school, yet alone a kid who doesn't walk or talk? She loves school. She's got friends, truly has friends this year. She's got kids wanting to play date. We have parents who are telling me the impact she has had on their lives. It's, it's incredibly moving. For Libby to be here, it not only changed her life, but it changed everybody's life at this school for the better because it has taught students to be more accepting. It has taught students to realize that gifts come in all packages. Every day last year, I was in fight or flight. Something was gonna happen. I knew I was gonna have to fight for something. I didn't wanna be angry, but I, I was, my adrenaline was pumped, and I said, I have hit a point in my life, first time God knows how long, that I'm not rearing up to fight. It's, it's smooth sailing. You can't put it into words. You have to kind of live it. It's just absolutely amazing. And the love they have for her, and it's reciprocated. It's just, it blew my mind. Absolutely blew my mind. Well, that's what it's all about. Parents meeting the needs of their children and having the opportunity to do so, to put them in a school environment that can meet those needs. Please go to our website at pefnc.org slash video for more stories like this. Representative Horn, that's what, it's, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing over there. Thank you for being here and thank you for the work that you've done in this for over the many, many years. We want to continue this, but here's what struck me about what the principal said. Yes, we met the needs of this little girl, but did you hear what the principal addressed mostly? This girl has made the difference in our student population and the other kids that are there. So as a head of school, being involved in school administration for many years, the number one thing that parents are looking for is uh, safety. Number one is safety. But then number two, how are you going to deal with the problem of bullying? Uh, this is a word that is used in so many different areas and ways of, of schools right now. And uh, uh, this helps solve that problem as well. Uh, it's educating those kids that are already there, and Libby has great friends. Libby couldn't have the wheelchair or the laptop that she can't verbally speak words, but she writes them without the educational savings account that complements the scholarship she received through the learning disabilities. So that's just one story. I can give you a story from a middle class perspective. That was me. We're in Durham. Uh, our kids are in Durham Public Schools. Uh, we are watching them grow through their elementary years. Uh, we get to about the fifth grade and we know that the, you know, Garrett's getting ready to go to the sixth grade, which is now that wonderful age of middle school, uh, where you never have any problems, right? Uh, so Garrett's getting ready to go to the middle school. We understood the middle school he would have to go to. He would have to go to. We knew the problems there. We knew the failing grades there. We knew what was going on within the faculty, the lack of administrative care. Uh, just, uh, just not a good situation, nor did we see any ways or means to improve what was going on there. And so uh, I, with my uh, uh, character program, was invited to come speak at North Raleigh Christian Academy right up the road. Sonny Sherrill, who has been the head of school there for 25 years, invited me to come and speak to all of the kids. Uh, our video series that was in school systems all over the country needed to be updated. You have to have this stuff up to date for kids and the relevance there. I'm looking for a school to redo it and update it. And as a good head of school would do after I spoke, he gave me a tour of North Raleigh Christian Academy. Uh, I fell in love with it. I brought my wife over. She looked at it. We saw how it would meet the needs of our children. Garrett going to the sixth grade, Caroline going to the fourth grade. We made a choice. We walked with our feet. We sold our home and we moved to North Raleigh. I want you to keep that in mind for a minute. What was the main reason we did such a dramatic, made such a dramatic change in our lives? It was our children and what's best for our children. We were able to make that choice, we did make that choice, and it made all the difference in the lives of our kids' education and where they are today. My heart is for every North Carolinian, every mom and dad, to be able to make a choice like that. Libby's mom was able to make a choice thanks to the scholarship. 
Uh, but the bottom line is being able to make that choice makes all of the difference. Now note, we left an area. We left an area. So if, if where are people going to really choose to live? When you, when you bought your house, what was one of the number thing, one things you were looking into? The schools, I bet. The schools. And so if they're not good, then we move out. If we move out, then what's left behind? Those who can't move out. What's happening to that area economically? What are businesses doing? And why is this happening? It's all because of choice. I had the ability to do it. Many do not have the ability to do it. They are stuck. Their communities are failing. Their, the businesses are leaving. The economies are falling. And, and it's all because of that reason. So keep that in mind just for a minute as we move along a little bit further. One thing I do, one thing I do want to share with you that is coming soon, uh, we just did a, a parent survey of all of the parents that we've worked with through our program. And we're going to be releasing in the coming weeks that survey of about 1,500 parents with Opportunity Scholarship students. Now remember, these are the ones that are the underprivileged families that do not have the ability until they get this Opportunity Scholarship to make that choice. But just a couple of highlights uh, that we will be releasing is, out of the 1,500 parents that responded to our survey, 97% of those parents were satisfied or greatly satisfied with the new school of their choice. 97%. 99% said they feel safe in the new school of their choice. And then when we asked them, why did you make this move? I was more interested uh, on what was on the bottom of that list than what was on the top of the list. Because what was on the bottom of the list was because of my neighborhood school. So think about that. The most convenient place for them to go is on the bottom of the list of their choice it comes back to the quality of education. It comes back to safety issues. It comes back to all of these character-related issues that seem so lacking. So you're going to see more of this in the coming weeks as we release our, our parent survey. So I'm very happy to share with you that North Carolina is a national leader on this whole issue of education reform. And to do that, I would like to just give you just a brief background. I'm just, I, we just went back 11, uh, to 2011 so that you can see how this developed and how we became that national leader. I also want to call to your attention that when you see 2011 on the bottom, that year we had a Democrat governor and we had a Republican legislature. Not a supermajority, but a Republican legislature. So in 2011, the, uh, the first thing that happened was the cap was eliminated on charter schools and we also launched the disability scholarship. That is significant. Democrat governor, Republican legislature. Does that sound familiar for 2019? In 2013, Opportunity Scholarship Program was established. In 2015, the Opportunity Scholarship was ruled constitutional. So a lot of our critics in this feel that one of the best ways to challenge it is in the courts. Uh, that was done and uh, we won on that issue in that year. In 2016, uh, the General Assembly forward funded, uh, forwarded funds for the Opportunity Scholarship. 2017, uh, we became the sixth state to launch the Education Savings Account. And then in 2018, forward funding was also upheld in the courts. Uh, we are winning the issue publicly um, because, again, we are working directly with families and children. Uh, our critics want to protect the status quo of the system. We're saying the system needs to be reformed. And reform does not mean eliminate it, it means make it better. Make it better, reaching across the aisle. One thing I'd like to add to this to, to show you what I mean by where we're coming from in PF and see where we're not opposed to uh, traditional public schools. While all of this was going on, the General Assembly raised teacher pay by 19% since 2013, uh, resulting in average salaries hitting $50,000 for the first time in our state's history. Uh, they increased uh, funding for public education by nearly $700 million while providing $35 million for school safety initiatives. They created the North Carolina Promise Tuition Program, making college more affordable at a trio of universities across our state. And they reduced class sizes in kindergarten through the third grade. So no other state, no other state has created more new educational choice programs in North Carolina 
which now offers a pair of scholarships for families with students with special needs, plus the Opportunity Scholarship that empowers low-income and minority families to send their child to the private school of their choice that helps meet their needs. That is significant. That is significant. Finally, where do we go from here? Well, as the new leader, uh, we, I'm, I'm thrilled at the 12-year foundation that's been laid for this organization, the work that's being done in the field. Again, if it was not for the parent liaison team and our staff, just a staff of eight, um, these programs would not be fully subscribed and there would not be waiting lists by the thousands. So we're very proud of that and we're continuing to grow that. I would like to take it just a little bit further. Um, I would like to talk about how education reform and school choice has economic benefits and environmental in, uh, benefits. Uh, I'm thrilled to get to know this gentleman back here, Bart Danielson from uh, Professor NC State University, who has done an awful lot of research on the economics of this issue. This is Bart's famous dots. <laughs> um, what I want you to see here is just to give you an idea of what I mean by where do people go as far as a school is concerned. The, the, if you can see the, the darker dot in the middle, that's Franklin Academy, a charter school established what year, Bart? Do you remember, uh, Brian? Okay, all right. Now, when it, was, uh, when, it was, when it was established in its location, all of the families that became a part of that charter school were located in all of those different, you see how spread out they are? Well, as the school became more and more successful, if I can find my cursor here to start this, where is it? Am I getting? Hold on one second, because this is great. I'm telling you, this is good stuff. Watch the dots. Those are families, really. families moving. Families moving. Now, where were they at the beginning? I think, I think it does that. There, there they are at the beginning. And now, as they become involved in the school, there they are now. Let's talk economics. This sells. This benefits people. This has a direct benefit on communities and improving the social structure of the community, but also improving the economic structure of the community. Now think about it. If, if, if we go in the opposite direction and they move out, those that can, like Libby and I could, who's left behind? Those that can't afford to move out. And therefore, they're in an area of poverty while businesses continue to leave because they're going to go where the business is and then the infrastructure declines and all of that. But when you have the opportunity to choose the school that you want to and it's located right in the middle of that particular area and it's meeting the needs of children, this is what happens. That's why I believe this can be one of the great economic issues of our time. Uh, empowering parents, giving them the ability to attend the school of their choice builds the economy of the community. Now, the other thing I thought about, too, and I'm not exactly sure how far out a lot of these dots were. Bart might could elaborate on that. But think about this. Um, I remember in 1979, when I was a senior at Northern Durham High School, I could get on the Durham Freeway and drive to the North Carolina State Fair right through the Research Triangle Park and never see another car come in the opposite direction. In 1979, I remember it well. Not only do we have the, the RTP, the 40, the extension of 40, now we have 540. You've been on 540? Have you looked who's driving the cars? One person. Where are they going? To work. All right, so if we have moved out of the city or the area because of the schools, we have to go back in to work. Not only are we creating all this congestion on our highways, but we're polluting the air. We're polluting the air, the carbon emissions out of all these cars. School choice, I contend, will help the environment. It'll help, help, help the environment in that regard. So there are so many benefits that we are looking into, and I appreciate Bart's uh, research on this, and we want to work with him, and also some of uh, the uh, uh, economic benefits of certain communities that we can do uh, that we're looking into to show how this works. And Bart has also been able to demonstrate how this works in a, a city in California 
that was an absolute barren place that now because of a, uh, a, a school of the arts is now a bustling, beautiful community that's safe. The economic benefit of school choice, the environmental benefit of school choice, and then I would also add, add here at the end the, um, the, the character of school choice. The character of school choice. Uh, I've attended some of the Thales schools around here, and one of the things that impressed me the most of the Thales school is that they have one gigantic room designed in the middle of every single one of them, and in that room is designed for one thing to teach and one thing only, respect, responsibility, maturity, discipline, and character. And the impact that that has on the lives of kids as we educate them, not only academically, but also in those areas. So when we're talking about the problems of bullying and all of these other things, those things are addressed. And where are they in the public schools? Are they there? We worked very hard to get them there when we had the funding and the ability to do that, and we did it very, very well. So we're saying we can improve in those areas in all of those places. And then, of course, the issue of safety. I, I love this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King. Intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. The complete education gives one not only power of concentration, but worthy objectives upon which to concentrate. The broad education will therefore transmit one, not only the accumulated knowledge of the race, but also the accumulated experience of social living. A major part of education that it seems to be so lacking and why so many parents leave. So that's what PFNC is all about. That's where PFNC is heading. And with that, I would love to have an opportunity to see and hear your thoughts or your questions. I'd also like to ask, if you don't mind, before we get started on that, I again want to introduce Brian Jodis. Come on up, Brian. Uh, Brian Jodis has been with the uh, organization now for about three years, four years? Uh, a little over two. Okay, a little over two. And uh, Brian works very uh, much in our marketing area, our communications, the legislative piece of it, uh, and so forth. And so, uh, Brian, a few words that you might want to share with us, and then we'll open the door for questions. Well, Mike, you so eloquently put it, and, and, and greatly appreciate that. And it's always great to be here at the Locke Foundation, so thank you for that hospitality. I'll be, I'll be really brief and just wanted to, to touch on something Mike mentioned and, and kind of drive it home with this group. And, and we're amongst many friends, and, and I don't know that everybody in the room supports everything that we do, but I can assume that many of you do, and that's why you're here today. I would say the, the one thing that we try to ensure we always focus on from our organization is sharing what parents think. We are parents for educational freedom in North Carolina. We're not legislators for educational freedom. We're not schools for educational freedom. We're parents for educational freedom. It's why our organization was founded in the first place. So hopefully what you see from us is that we will carry the voice of parents. And I ask this group to think about that as you talk about this issue moving forward. What do parents want? What fits their needs? And that's what we try to focus on. And I believe that's why we've seen a spike in these numbers, in non-traditional education. When you've seen an upward trend over the last three years on one side of the ledger, it's because that's what parents want. Nobody's forcing this upon them. And so we'll always try to carry that story. It's what I try to focus on through external affairs at PFNC. And so I just ask folks in this room to, to be cognizant of that. And as you're seeing and hearing things in your communities, let us know. My email is really easy to remember. It's my name, Brian, with an I, the one and only way you should ever spell the name Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at PEFNC.org. Very simple. So email us. Anything that you see going on in your communities, we're there to help share those stories and, and grateful for Mike's leadership, and we're just happy to keep uh, carrying that on. And I know he'll answer some questions or anything I can help with. I'll jump in as well. Yes, sir. I picked up my daughter at a car mechanic's place this morning and was driving her back. Uh, she has been 14 years a speech pathology teacher, uh, both in California and now in the Durham public school system. And so she and I were talking about what you were going to be talking about. Her concern is, is that you're dealing with parents who are invested in their kids' education. She has dealt with hundreds of kids over her 14 years of experience whose parents really don't give a damn. Mm -hmm. What do you do with them, she said, as, as charter schools and other opportunities exist for kids whose parents care, mm -hmm. 
those kids will go to certain schools, and a lot of the schools, like the ones that she's taught at, will be left with kids whose parents really just don't right. care. For right. Well, I've never met a teacher who was in the profession for the money. So my first question is, why are you in the profession? I know why I went into the profession. I love kids. I wanted to make a difference in their lives. And I still find that to be true of most teachers. And that's why they're there. I think what happens is when you uh, burn out because of certain situations and things of the school, then that tends to reflect on either the way you teach or how you work with kids. So one thing that I would always advocate is professional development for those teachers. That's what they need. Uh, professional development, finding new ways and skills to help them grow in those areas. So you're right. There are a lot of parents that just don't care. But the teacher does. The teacher does. And the teacher can make the difference in the life of that child. I can only reflect back to myself and what I was put into. I didn't want to be in that trailer I was put in a trailer with 30 kids labeled lost cause whose parents did not care. But a teacher came along that did. That's what I would try to do when I talk about how do we improve the, the traditional public school. We can do it in several ways. But I will say this, as important it is to pay teachers well, just throwing dollars at a salary won't do it. So there has to be professional development and other tools and opportunities. And Parents for Educational Freedom represents all of that. We want all of that for schools. Unfortunately, she was started out when she moved here at a school where the principal didn't care. Mm -hmm. There's been huge teacher turnover in that school. Mm -hmm. And complaints issued to the school system here in school system, that principal is still doing just fine right there. And one of the first things that I did when I came on board here was develop a five-year strategic plan for our organization as to where we're going with this and how where the next level. One of the things that I would like to do and we're looking into is uh, uh, creating a position in our organization as, uh, for an accountability director, someone that can bring a coalition of people together to, to, to hold principals and administrators accountable, to hold teachers accountable, to hold the schools accountable and the systems accountable. That's a big one, and that's one that we want to explore as we move forward. Mm -hmm. Can I have one point? Sure, yeah. sure, Brian. I, also, I don't know if we're on the thing, so you might want to we'll use this. Hold, well, I could stand next to you and we could hold okay. arms or something. I, I'd also say too to the to the uh, to maybe the idea that parents don't care, and, and you know what, there, there are some parents out there that, that maybe don't. Uh, I think you've got to be cognizant of what the situation is like for those families. I think there are thousands of families across our state who every single day are just trying to tread water and survive, and they're in many situations where maybe their ability to have to work a night shift or overnight or not be there physically for their kids uh, could be perceived as that. I'm not saying that's always the case, but I'm saying just think about that some standpoint. I had a conversation with the principal last week. We were down at Roland, which is where the Innovative School District has come into Robinson County. And I asked him something about students who want to learn, motivated teachers, and engaged parents. He said, hey, can I stop you right there for a minute? Think about supportive parents who maybe just can't be engaged. And many low-income parents are in a different situation than maybe many of us where they want to be a part of it, but maybe it's perceived they're not just because they physically can't be there. I know that probably wasn't the intent, but I'm just saying think about those things as well. I work with four Absolutely. Lot, and it wasn't those that she was talking about because she's got a lot of right. people who care. But when mama is snorting crack uh, or smoking mm -hmm. crack right. all day long and has three kids yeah. three different fathers mm -hmm. and she's the parent, so let's see if we can't find a way to empower those parents and those families and lift those kids up out of that. You know what I mean? And so, and many times maybe this can be the way, the way to do it. Yep. Yes. Uh, I'm really ecstatic that the cap is gone. I think that was a wonderful achievement. Mm -hmm. Whoever did it, well done. Mm -hmm. But there's still much, the minefield of getting a charter school approved is so, is still so bad. Yeah. It's dominated by the people from the tradi traditional schools mm -hmm. who, it's kind of like, I'm McDonald's, I want to open a burger place, and I've got to get permission from Wendy's. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, that, this is crazy stuff. And we need to have another reform initiative in, in Raleigh. And it, it also happens at the local level. Mm -hmm. If you want to see what's the bad stuff going on, you're from Durham. Mm -hmm. Look at the Voyager Academy and the non-unfair ways their project is being victimized. Mm -hmm. the, so it's happening at all levels of government mm -hmm. and needs to be stopped. And uh, if I can do anything to help that process, sign me up. 
Thank you. We agree. <laughs> yes, sir. The one uh, area you mentioned is the federal government. You, you, you went into what happened in the prior administration, and I remember one thing Trump had said. He goes, you want more education, be local. But nationally, have you seen a change in how this is being approached? Well, we know that Betsy DeVos is a strong advocate for this. Uh, we would like for her to become a stronger, more vocal advocate for this. Uh, let me just leave it at that for now. <laughs> but uh, yes, um, the, the support is there when the time is right, I think. Uh, right now, for us as an organization, we are concentrating on the state of North Carolina. We, that, that's where our heart is. That's where our concern is. That's where a lot is being done and, and, and other states are emulating. So it'll grow from here and that's where, that's where we're focused right now. A lot of our funding does come from a national organization. I don't mind sharing uh, American Federation for Children, which is also a, one of the leading advocates in the country for school choice and education reform. Uh, and so we are in the process now of trying to establish more support here in North Carolina through educational foundations, organizations, and individuals uh, that can help us because we are a nonprofit. We're, we, we have no government funds whatsoever uh, to do the work that we do. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Um, one, one thing to address your question there. We just actually won a major package of multi-million dollars for charter school um, expansion and for the uh, development of and furthering the charter school. Do you want to mention the charter? Like okay. It's something like $30 million and it'll be broken up over a five-year period, something like that. Mm -hmm. But going back to the question about <clears throat> choice and driving economics, and like we've got, uh, Wake County is the 15th largest school district in the country. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very large district. A lot of people say it's too large, and mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's being mismanaged mm -hmm. in terms of they can't figure out where the kids are going to land, mm -hmm. whether they're going to be in Southern Wake County, Northern Wake County. They're building schools. They're renovating. They're, they basically made a giant dog's dinner out of the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, what would you say in terms of the school board who hasn't listened over the last five years of why parents, particularly in Wake County, are voting with their feet? leaving the traditional schools, going to charters, going to homeschool. And Wake County has the largest homeschooling population, the largest charter school population, and the largest private school population in the state. And it's only growing. So, you know, what is it that they're doing that Wake County isn't doing anymore? Is it just that Wake County is continuing on this traditional industrial level model and not, not innovating, not using best practices, and charter schools are? Or is it the flexibility that charter schools have to deal with the curriculum that was forced on them back in, what, was it 2011 now when Common Core came mm -hmm. into place where mm -hmm. parents are just like, I've had it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, where, where's the happy medium? Is, is it in part and fault for, to the school district? Or is it part and fault to the parents? Or, <laughs> I mean, well, a, that's a very big bundle of questions. All of the above. Um, but no, um, remember, when you've done something a certain way for so long, it's just hard to break it. Plus, there are some that advocate what the system stands for. Uh, there are many who believe that it is uh, the ability to indoctrinate into different schools and, and the public schools, indoctrinate a certain type of, of uh, uh, philosophy, et cetera. Uh, we're seeing that politically as we see uh, a lot of these others uh, on a socialism side of the equation that are coming on the scene as that's the answer. So I, I, when we talk about reform, and we're talking about working with parents and children, we win the issue. When we talk about the system, the bureaucratic system that is failing, and the, all of the evidence demonstrate why it's failing, then they lose the issue. And so that's why our focus will be to continue to educate from that vantage point. There are some that are always going to protect the system. And so that's, that's part of our job in our education piece and what we're doing uh, in, in, uh, throughout the state to educate people about what you just saw today. Bart, Bart you want to add to that? No, I, okay. I had a question. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Did you want to add anything to that? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the state of Florida recently passed a bill that uh, allows children who have been voting Freedom uh, 
in North Carolina and be supportive of that kind of when we know that one of the number one issues for parents is safety, school safety, that's one of the number one concerns, which includes that area of bullying, we're going to look into every avenue. As Brian said, we are representing parents. So we're going to look into every avenue to pursue what works in that particular area. I also know that this issue can very much change the political scene. And we saw evidence of that in Florida. Uh, if any of you saw the Wall Street Journal article, uh, on the exit polling that was done and DeSantos wins what 13 million votes and wins that election by what about 12,000 votes and it was learned that uh, 12 to 13,000 votes came from predominantly African American moms who are benefiting from school choice in the state of Florida think about that Oh, I, you're right. But what, what the way I the the way that I would share that is they voted against the candidate who was not school choice. I agree. Yeah. And that's exactly what they did, and that's the way they. That's what they. That did. is correct. That is correct. Make a, a statement. You talked about accountability. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working with a sister organization of John Locke and, and Civitas in another state, and the proposal is going to be a pilot program where we go into public schools. And the principals are trained to have their own, to, to create their own curriculum in concert with teachers and parents, perhaps students. But the state is, the state receives a deliverables from the principal who then reports to the state, I did this, I need help here, whatever. And the state is responsible for basically some umbrella services like transportation, legal issues, things of that nature. But eventually the intention is to transition to where each school has enough active parents or, or civic leaders that they can form their own trustees or board. And eventually the state seeds away. Now that's a very, <laughs> very big deal. But well, I can... The accountability issue of this is Right, that is the key issue. That's the one that we want to pursue the most and we're starting this year as we're looking into that. As a head of school, one of the first priorities that I would do, and I led to, uh, was take the authority away from the uh, administration oversight of the school regarding curriculum directly to the principal. The high school principal knows what the academic needs of that high school is. He, she knows the makeup of that high school. Same with the middle school principal, same with the elementary principal. They may not have liked me very much because that put a lot of extra work on them. Rather than having one standard curriculum director made all the difference in the world in both of our schools that I had the privilege of leading. I learned a lot from that. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. No, you. <laughs> the lady in red. I have public school friends who are teachers. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. um, well, I have a, a sister-in-law who falls in that particular category too. We have some very lively discussions. Um, that's the last thing on our minds. That's the last thing that the agenda is. We are helping the very ones that Dr. King was talking about get out of the condition that they're in. Now, that's not segregation because when you look at these schools, and if you look at private schools, Many of the private schools are looking for diversity. What's one of the major reasons why they can't achieve diversity? It's the economic reasons. Those that could create a diverse student population can't afford to pay the tuition in their school. But yet they would love to have those kids in the school. So again, you have a situation where the door is open to create more, especially in the private school sector. Uh, so no, it's not. These are... These are emotional buzzwords that are always going to be used, the word racism and the word segregation. And that's why our critics, or however we want to identify those who are 
so vocally against what we're trying to achieve here. Those are the key terms that they use because those are the ones that pull the button. Now, go though to our parent liaison team that's working with thousands and thousands and thousands, predominantly African-American moms, who are all for this program. Why? Because they are directly benefiting from it and their kids are directly benefiting from it. So you don't hear one word about segregation and you don't hear one word about racism. And so that's why we continue to put together, uh, we've got plenty of other videos. Please go on our website to see those very parents speaking out about that. Do you have any statistics? I've got a couple. Yeah, yeah sure, absolutely. Uh, share. Sorry. So for, from a statistics standpoint, it's a wonderful question. I, I, my phone is over there. I would have looked up the hard numbers. So I, I think I'm pretty close on these. Uh, I believe the percentage of African-American students in our traditional public schools is roughly 25 or 26 percent. Anybody in the room that studies that might know, right? Uh, percentage of white students in traditional public schools is 27 percent, 28. I mean, they're basically within a percentage point of each other. Uh, African-American students on the Opportunity Scholarship is somewhere between 30 and 35 percent. Higher percentage of students on the Opportunity Scholarship program are African-American than are statistics-wise, percentage-wise in traditional public schools. And if you combine African-American and Hispanic families, it's about 40 percent of the population on the Opportunity Scholarship program. The other 40 percent would be white. So if you just look at the raw statistics of that, it shows you that more are turning out from that standpoint. And again, this isn't a numbers point. This is a bit more of just the conversations point. You've got to ask families why they want these. No one's forced to go to a public charter school. No one's forced to go to a private school. They make that choice. Why do they make it? We've heard from many families who will say, specifically African-American moms, there's a charter school down the street from where I live that I'm going to try to get on the lottery to go to school there because there's an African-American leader who teaches at that school. And I'd like my son to be at that school. That's not a statistic point. That's just what a family wants. That's what that mom wants. So take all the statistics, and they are what they are, and you can look at those numbers again. About 40% of the families on the Opportunity Scholarship are minority. About 40% are white. And that's not even taking into account Asian Americans that are on there as well. So you have to look at those things and then butt that up against hearing from families as to why they're looking to make those choices as well. That's all the time we have for questions. These guys will stick around uh, to answer any questions you may have. Next week, we are hosting Dr. Mandy Cohen, the Secretary of the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services to talk about building a healthy North Carolina. So we hope you can come to that. Let's give these guys a round of applause. And please take the scars. Please take them. <laughs>